Well, good evening. This is Handog Steve coming to you on the 5th of February. Oh my God, is it the 5th of February already? Uh, so we're doing a little wrap up of the news this week and uh, here we are. The Peterson Paradox. Uh, once again in the news. Uh, earnest academic or just another angry white guy? Uh, now, I think this has come about because uh, in the non-fiction, uh, it's the number one bestseller uh, on the Globe and Mail best-selling book list. And it is also the number one bestseller on Amazon.com. OK, so uh, here they take another swipe at the guy. Um, if psychology has always been the smorgasbord of soft sciences, Peterson's brand of profundity is the sprawling all-you-can-eat buffet, a medley of undercooked ideas warmed up under the heat lamp of his own faintly flickering intellect. Well, uh, there is a reason that this book, and uh, yes, I uh, purchased the book by Jordan Peterson. I can highly recommend it. I've just started it along with the Gulag Archipelago, which uh, Jordan Peterson highly recommends as uh, required reading. And uh, I've also been watching uh, his videos on YouTube. Uh, every lecture that he has done is up on YouTube. Uh, they are definitely worth watching. The man is absolutely brilliant. Um, he is not a flickering flame of his own uneven intellect. He is a master thinker. And I think that every person, but young men especially, should go listen to Jordan Peterson. And uh, I think you'll find that he will change your life as he has changed my life and given me a new understanding of how things fit together. So I can, uh, I can't, I just can't speak highly enough of Jordan Peterson as a person, as an individual, as his, his integrity, his honesty, um, his uh, lack of hubris. Um, absolutely brilliant. Please go check out Jordan Peterson for yourself. I think that you will thoroughly enjoy listening to some of the things and some of the points that he has to make about living in today's world and where they actually come from. Because, you know, we are about to repeat history. Uh, I've said this before and I'm going to say it again. Yes, I am. Uh, globalism is just another fancy name for cultural Marxism. Okay, it has all the hallmarks of this ideology uh, with the... Um, group identity, uh, everyone uh, identifies with a particular group and uh, yes this is, it was dangerous and it still is dangerous thinking. Okay next story, uh, why is loneliness so toxic? Okay so Jordan Peterson I'm sure could have helped to answer this question but um, Study after study suggests loneliness is a health hazard, raising a person's risk of a wide range of illnesses from cardiovascular disease and cancer to depression and dementia. And you know, one of the things that I have made an absolute point of doing, because I've seen this play out so many times in my store. Firstly, I volunteer. Okay, when you volunteer, this puts you into a group of people of all age groups, of different backgrounds, with one common interest. And so this exposes you not only to stimulating conversation, but uh, the great feeling that you get from doing something within your community. I make sure that I have friends of different ages uh, one of the problems that my parents are going through right now, uh, my mum and dad are 100 years old this year on uh, June 22nd and um, they have outlived all of their friends and now they're finding it difficult uh, in relating to even 70 year olds. You know, that, that's a 30 year age gap. And so, uh, yes, make friends of all different age groups. And there's a reason that solitary confinement is used as a punishment because the mind starts to play tricks on you when you are alone. I'd heard uh, that in the um, special 
uh, the SAS Special Air Services, uh, one of the training things is that you're put on an island for two weeks and you have to survive alone. And apparently the reports back from the people who undergo that test uh, say that it is one of the hardest things to accomplish, even though they're in radio contact and they have enough to survive and they can call in and be airlifted out at any point in time. But being alone with yourself is not as easy as people think. And uh, the mind, you know, the mind reminds me of, um, did you ever see Doctor Who? and the TARDIS where you've got like this little police box on the outside and you open it up and I mean the place is huge inside because the inside uh, um, occupies a different temporal spatial area from the outside and uh, you know it's it's like I don't know 20 football fields layered one on top of the other and uh, you, you it's amazing that you can get lost well the mind is like that and that's why many people do get lost in the corridors of their own mind and that is why even if you don't feel like going out uh, I think you have to force yourself out into society force yourself into positions where you're making uh, a meaningful contribution a meaningful contribution and I can tell you over 26 years of barbering and watching people come and go uh, getting older and passing away that the ones who have enjoyed their retirement the most are the ones who stayed active, they stayed interested in world issues, they got out and they went to places where they could communicate and uh, form community with people, they volunteered and they stayed engaged or they ran a small business, something that kept them in contact with the public because you know it's amazing how quickly you can get out of date uh, you know, fashions come and go, of course, as we see, whether it be clothing or in cars or uh, architecture or this kind of stuff. Uh, well, you, you can find it very easy to get trapped into one particular architectural style. And you need to be around people who will challenge that to keep these things in your mind flexible so you can move them around and keep them malleable and I believe you know uh, this is the sort of thing that fends off dementia and Alzheimer's next story Hillary lost but the future is hers well give me a break uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's too tedious and too self-indulgent and too narcissistic for words. This is from the New York Times. And uh, I'm just going to read the little caption with the photograph. And it says, although Hillary Clinton lost, she made running for president seem like a normal thing for a woman to do. So we're, we're supposed to believe that Hillary Clinton is the only female who has successfully run for a position in office or in industry come on we, we've been doing this for years now and this is where I think some of the feminist movement has gone off the rails is that it might not be quite even yet but I can tell you there is an awful lot of women right up to the present day who have been the heads of state in different countries around the world and uh, I went onto Wikipedia and here is that page you can take a little look for yourself so as you can see this is from uh, Wikipedia and this is a list of uh, female presidents or heads of state and here we are back 1940 mandate started mandate end four years I can't even pronounce that name so we're not even gonna go there but you will see as we scroll down uh, Mongolia, Salon, India, China, Israel, Argentina, African Republic, United Kingdom, Portugal, Bolivia. So right the way from 1940, scroll down here, 1940, 2007, 2008, 2009. See how huge, I mean this list is huge of women who have reached the pinnacle Chile President Michelle Bachelet 
Uh, so for Hillary Clinton to say that uh, she made it normal to have a woman running for president is just absolute nonsense. And so even in uh, Trinidad and Tobago, President, 19th of March, 2018, Romania, Prime Minister, 29th of January, 2018. Dame Sandra Mason, Barbados, Governor General, 8th of January, 2018. So right the way up, Iceland, 2017, right the way up. And there you go. Next story. Past stain on Ireland will soon be gone. This is about the Magdalene laundries in Ireland. And it is absolutely staggering. Uh, here, here is the building right here. And uh, the street that it's uh, on. Now the Magdalene laundries were laundries that were set up by the Catholic nuns. And they would have taken wayward girls, uh, girls who got themselves pregnant, uh, this kind of stuff. And um, they were to adopt out the children and give these young girls an education and um, some kind of career. Well, basically what they did, they ran these laundries and they slave drove the girls. There was lots of abuse. There was assaults. Um, there was the pimping, literally pimping out of these girls to all kinds of tradespeople and priests in the area. Uh, there was another Magdalene laundry that was being torn down recently um, because the property had sold and uh, they dug up a septic tank with 800 small skeletons, 800 babies that had been drowned in this septic tank. It was absolutely atrocious and I, I, I bring it up because does the abuse of the Catholic Church ever end? You think that with the nuns there would at least be some kind of integrity, some morality, but no. And this was going on, okay, uh, it had around 100 workers at a time and took its last inmates in 1995, closing its doors the following year, 1996. Okay, that is only 22 years ago that these young girls were being abused and forgotten about uh, in our society um, and abused by other women. That's, that's the tragedy of this. This is women being abused by women. And I think if there's any takeaway from this uh, is that we are all men and women all genders, people, are capable of the absolute greatest good, the highest of integrity, and the lowest of lows. And it doesn't matter what walk of life, you're going to find these people everywhere you go. So keep taking that higher path. Uh, it may not be the easiest route uh, for the feet to take, but I'll tell you one thing, it's the easiest route for the soul to take. Uh, I sleep easy at night because I have tried for at least the last 20 years to be honest with myself and to stay true, to, st to stand in my own truth and not to allow my mind to be pathologized by the lies and idiocies that we are seeing perpetrated today in our society. Okay, here's a little story. Uh, VW Gas's top exec. Uh, VW, after going through uh, an emission scandal uh, in 2015, only just settled last year, um, he was suspended over monkey experiments. Uh, automaker Volkswagen has suspended a top executive in response to widespread public criticism of experiments in which monkeys were exposed to diesel exhaust. Uh, the company said in a statement Tuesday that the Thomas Stegg, head of government relations and sustainability, was stepping away from his duties at his own request. The statement from the automaker said that the company was drawing the first consequences as it investigates the activities of EUGT, the entity backed by Volkswagen and other car makers that commissioned the monkey experiment. 
Now you'd think that somebody would have seen not just the inappropriateness of an experiment like that with animals, but to be gassing monkeys is just such a horrible connection to the death camps. Uh, I am just stunned. I'm stunned that nobody saw that. Although I will uh, have a little sidebar here, although it's on the same topic. You know, I had a customer in my store a couple of years ago, and this young lad uh, was working for a German company that uh, manufactured products uh, for the construction industry. And uh, basically, what he did was he proofread the ads that were going in foreign magazines to make sure that they read right in context with that country's um, history and understanding of language, colloquialisms and that kind of stuff. And so I asked him what, what was the funniest thing that he'd come across. And uh, he told me a story of uh, they had made this cement mixer and uh, the heading for the ad was uh, the final solution. And uh, you know, they, they just didn't get <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, I mean, I'm sorry if that's inappropriate laughing, but uh, just to not see that calling a cement mixer the final solution. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. So uh, this kid had a great job proofreading all the ads that went into uh, foreign magazines. Okay, last story. And possibly the most important. This is a water crisis in Iran and you can see there is a receding lake and this is happening all over the world. These inland lakes are receding. Um, it says water crisis followed by unrest and I can tell you nothing stirs up trouble like a lack of resources, especially water because you can die within three days without water, without fluids. So all over the world we are polluting the water that we drink. And uh, here is a little clip of uh, Cape Town. Uh, they are basically looking at zero day and this little clip will explain that. And uh, here's a real crisis underway. Cape Town is 90 days away from running out of water. And when was this written? January the 15th, 2018. After three years of unprecedented drought, the South African city of Cape Town has less than 90 days worth of water in its reservoirs, putting it on track to be the first major city in the world to run out of water. Unless the residents drastically cut down on daily use, warns Cape Town Mayor Patricia DeLille, taps in the seaside metropolis of 4 million will soon run dry. What happens when the taps are turned off? Cape Town enters Mad Max territory. Well, almost. Residents will have to go to one of the 200 municipal water points throughout the city where they can collect a maximum of 25 litres, 6.6 .6 gallons a day. Um, guards will be standing by to keep the peace and prevent anyone from taking more than their share. Of course, the truly wealthy will be protected. The local version of Craigslist is already full of listings for companies wanting to truck in tankers full of water from less drought prone parts of the country for a price. Okay, and here are some pictures. This is from Bloomberg. Here we see the reservoirs running dry. Swimming pools. And these are some of the communal taps that they will be using to carry water. And uh, you can see the dwindling supply. So they've known since 2013 that this is going to be an ongoing issue. I don't want to underestimate how catastrophic day zero could be, said Clem Sunter, an independent scenario planner who has been advising the city. It would require thousands of tankers to provide a minimal level of water to each person. You would have to think of temporarily evacuating people. Okay, so as I say, water is going to be the world's next 
major crisis. So we better stop fouling our own drinking water. I mean, how stupid do you have to be to not realize that you cannot foul your own nest? And we have paid short shrift to the idea of treating sewerage. Uh, basically, we just throw it into more water. We break it down. And of course, in India, I mean, there are rivers in India that basically have so much sewerage going into them that a water treatment plant, actually, there's not enough water in the river to actually treat. OK, so we are reaching critical mass as far as water is concerned. And if you think that a war cannot start over water, water rights, water issues, uh, when you have people living on that small amount of water a day, you have limited cleaning, you have limited drinking, cooking, washing up. Uh, just think how many times it, it would actually be what, what, you, what you should do is uh, put, a, put the plug in your bathtub. Uh, have a shower, all the water that you use uh, during the course of the day, just pour it into the bathtub and see how much is left at the end of the day. And uh, 25 litres is not a lot. So as you can see, water is a big issue around the world. We can't grow anything without water. We can't sustain ourselves without water. And trust me, if you have a water shortage in your country, it will not take long before you either have a civil war, political unrest, or a war with your neighbors who have uh, more abundant supplies of water. People will do what they have to do. And you know, I read a Rand Institute um, piece on the carrying capacity of the planet and uh, one of the things it pointed out uh, was that in the history of humankind okay humans have never changed their behavior on this one issue and that when humans are faced with the choice between starving and raiding humans raid that's what we do folks we raid and we see evidence of it all around. If you pay attention to some of the things going on in North Africa, right now, Somalia, uh, Afghanistan, these, many of these things, Egypt, uh, many of these things are brought on by food shortages. Well, if you think food shortages were bad enough, you wait until you get water shortages. And yet I hear no politician talking about water shortages. I think it's about time that that was placed at the top of the agenda. You know, I think uh, the issues that we are looking at today, like gender equity and so on and so forth, will pale, will pale in comparison to water shortages and polluted water and unpotable water. You know, in Canada here in the winter time, I am just aghast at the salt that gets thrown onto our roads to keep them safe for drivers. And I will agree that it does keep them safe. But, uh, you know, if you were to go up to a farmer and ask him if you can salt his fields, he will look at you like he's crazy. Well, when the melt comes in the springtime, where does all that salt go? Into our drains, our ditches, into the water table. And when do we reach a point of saturation? When do we reach that point? And I mean, there is a cautionary tale in the Middle East uh, for the Sumerians. Okay, this uh, was a civilization that existed about 5,000 years ago, and they were the first serious irrigators uh, of farmland. And uh, then when you irrigate, you salt your lands because a lot of that water evaporates and it leaves uh, natural mineral salts behind. So if you go to Baghdad today, and test the sand and soil around the city where you might be able to farm, you'll find that that pH level is still too high in the acid range to uh, permit wheat to be grown. That's 5,000 years ago. So there is a cautionary tale 
uh, what happens when you have an environmental uh, collapse okay when you cannot grow food for yourself and he was a once mighty nation uh, the Sumerians are uh, the people who came up with the concept of algebra and uh, Arabic numbering uh, they were an incredible race of people where are they now they are in the history books as a success in one side but a failure in another side of that story okay so I hope you liked this little news wrap up for the week and um, please if you did uh, like and subscribe uh, click that big red button it really helps when you do and uh, in the meantime this is Handbox Steve signing off wishing you an incredible week up ahead and we will talk very very soon you take care now see ya